On this particular occasion, I'd been invited to speak for a week in Houston, Texas. Now, anytime I'm invited to speak out of town, I go through a checklist. I have a routine. I recheck everything, like a pilot before takeoff. I go down my checklist. Do I have everything I'll need on this trip? I check my suitcase for suits, ties, toothbrush, everything. I check the briefcase. Do I have my Bible? Do I have books I can study on the way? Paper, pens, everything. On this trip, I was off, as I said, to Houston, and I checked and rechecked and double-checked everything before I took off. When I arrived, I had with me all that I needed, shoes, socks, even stuff to study. And then I discovered that in all of my planning, I'd left out one small detail. When it first dawned on me what I'd done, I couldn't believe it. I checked everything again, everything in the briefcase, everything in the suitcase, but it just was not there. I had flown to Houston, Texas to preach and left all my sermons back in Los Angeles. The most important thing in the trip, I left back Home. Now, in that situation, a phone call saved the day. But the point is that that's the danger in planning, that you leave something out. And not just that you leave something out, but that you leave the most important thing out. So what I want us to do today is talk about that. I want to talk about planning and making sure that you don't leave the most important thing out of the planning. Will you turn with me to James chapter 4, where James discusses, of all things, planning. James chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 13. Come now. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy, sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you're you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Now, it is obvious that in this passage, James is talking about planning. The plan is spelled out in detail in verse 13. But after that, he gives two reasons why you should not leave out the most important thing in a plan. So let's begin with the plan itself, which will tell us what is left out. Verse 13 may sound vague to you, but it's really very specific. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow. Now that's very specific. That's a very specific time we're going to do this. We will go to such and such a city. And he means a specific city. In the matter of fact, the way this is written in the original text, it's almost like he's pointing on a map and say we're going there. So his plan is detailed and specific. We're going to go to such and such a city, and we're going to spend a year there. So he knows how long he's going to be. There's a definite place, and there's a definite period of time for us to stay there. And on top of all of that, there is a specific purpose. We're going to buy and sell and make a profit. In other words, this is a business trip. Now you look at that and you say, well, what's wrong with that? And frankly, on the face, nothing is wrong with that. As a matter of fact, some years ago, 
I got interested in the subject of planning. A lot of people talk about having a plan. What does that look like? What, what is involved in constructing a plan? Now, one of the things I discovered is that people who talk about planning use all kinds of nomenclature, all kinds of terms to describe it. But the way I laid it out a number of years ago was something like this. A plan, first of all, consists of, besides a purpose, an objective. That's sometimes called a long-range goal. I called it an objective. I use the word goal to talk about a short-range goal. So there's a purpose, there's an objective, there's a goal, and then there's a program, what you're going to do, a schedule, which is the time frame, and, of course, a budget. Now, it seems to me that those are all the elements that are in James 4.13, that he has a purpose. We're going to go and buy and sell and make a profit. And we got a long-term objective. We're going to do it for a year. He has a short-term objective. We're going to start even earlier. We're going to leave today or tomorrow. So he has a program. He has a time frame. And, of course, assuming all of that, he had a budget. So he had an objective to make a profit, a goal to go to a specific city, a program to buy and sell, a schedule to leave no sooner than a year. So he mentioned everything but a budget, but it seems to me that that's assumed. After all, this is a business trip. Now let me make a suggestion that we all plan, or we should, right? I suspect that right now you have plans. You have a plan for perhaps next year's vacation. At the beginning of a school year, students have a plan for the year. You may have investment plans. You may even have business plans. We all have plans. So what's wrong with that? Answer, absolutely nothing in and of itself. I think I could argue that the Apostle Paul had a plan when he wrote to the Romans. He told them he was going to come visit them. That's part of his plan. And after that, he was going to go to Spain. He had a very detailed, specific plan. So what's the problem? Well, in this case, it's not mentioned until you get to verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The problem with the plan in verse 13 is it left God out. It took no consideration of the Lord himself. That's the problem with planning. We do the same thing, though, don't we? I know people have made plans for marriage and really didn't consider what God had to say about that. Even when we make plans for a vacation, I know of couples who've come back and said, you know, we had a great vacation, and oh, by the way, we forgot to take our Bible. It's that kind of thing. You just leave the Lord out of your plan. One commentator points out that James, just earlier in this chapter, discussed humility, which has to do with our relationship with the Lord and with others. And now he suggested James is developing the theme of humility in relationship to ourselves, especially to leave the Lord out and, as we shall see, brag about it. But at this point, I simply want to say that what James is saying so far is that it's possible to make a plan and leave God out. There's a very famous poem that puts it like this. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishment, the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I've got plans for it. I am the captain of my ship. Now, it's perfectly legitimate to have a plan. 
But if you leave God out of your future plans, James says, that's a problem. Look at verse 14. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Now, James is assuming that you're making this plan and leaving God out. And he says, that's not very smart. That's his point. You do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. So don't make plans that leave God out of those plans. If you will permit me, I'd like to use a word to describe that. It's stupid. Now, the word stupid, by the way, in English, means lack in understanding, sluggish in understanding, mentally dumb, foolish. And that's what I mean by the word stupid. To make a plan and leave God out of it, James says, is just plain stupid. The book of Proverbs says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And that's the point. You don't know. So leaving God out is just plain not smart. During a fierce storm in November of 1975, a freighter named the Edmund Fitzgerald sank in the waters of Lake Michigan. A week before, the chief steward, Robert Rafferty, mailed a postcard to his wife in Toledo, Ohio. He wrote, and I quote, I may be home by November 8th, However, nothing is for sure. And he was right. He didn't make it home. Because nothing is for sure. Now, in order to underscore this, James says, well, just think about life. Look at verse 14. Whereas you do not know what happens tomorrow. What is your life? It's a vapor. It's a vapor. It's a puff of smoke. It appears for a little time, and then it just vanishes away. In other words, life is brief. Since you may not even be alive in the future, it's unwise to make plans and leave God and his eternal truth out of your life. Life is brief. I'm not sure the young understand that or appreciate it, but I know the elderly do. The longer you live, the more you appreciate this truth. Life is brief. Let me tell you what the Bible says. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, it says, Life is like a shadow. One moment, a shadow dances on the earth's glass, grassy carpet, and then a cloud passes over, and that shadow is swallowed up, never to return. Psalm 73 says, life is a dream. It lasts for a moment, and you wake up. Life is like a puff of smoke, according to Psalm 102. Smoke lasts and lingers for seconds, maybe moments, and then it's all gone. Life is brief. And therefore, it's just not smart to make plans and leave God out of them. George Bernard Shaw once said, life is no brief candle. It's a splendid torch. The scriptures would beg to differ. It would say, life is not a torch, it's a brief candle. And not necessarily one that lasts all day. It's like a candle on a birthday cake, not a torch. When Michelangelo was well past 80 years of old age, he wrote, when I'm, 
if I've reached the 24th hour of my day and no project arrives in my brain which does not figure the death engraved upon it. That's an interesting analogy, isn't it? If 80 years of age were like 16 waking hours of every day, it would be like 6 a.m. in the morning. Then, uh, if it, you're 10 years old, uh, it's like 8 a.m. in the morning and breakfast is over. If you're 20 in a 24-hour day, it's like 10 a.m. If you're 30, it's noon. If you're 40, it's 2 a.m. and lunch is over. If you're 50, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. If you're 60, it's 6 and dinner is being served. If you're 70, it's 80 and the shadows have already fallen. If you're 80, it's 10 o'clock and the time for the lights to go out. Life is brief. Life is uncertain. On the other hand, death is certain. It's like a black camel which kneels at the gate of all. An epithet on a tombstone read, As you are, once I was, as I am, someday you will be. In light of the reality of life and death, it's simply foolhardy to leave God out of your life. Amen. Now, that's one problem. There's another. Look back at James chapter 4. He says in verse 16, But now you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Now notice, he says in verse 16, the boasting is evil. And he says in verse 17, to do, know to do good and do it not, it is sin. Now one of these, it seems to me, is what you do, you're boasting, and the other is what you do not do, obviously, in verse 17. So let's talk about these for just a second. I think what James is saying is this. If you leave God out of your life, that's not just stupid, that's sinful. And boasting about it is evil. But that's exactly what some people do. They decide they are captain of their ship. They make plans for where the ship is going to sail. And they are in charge. They're clever. They're skillful. I am in control of my life. Well, that's the kind of thing James is talking about in verse 16. You boast in your arrogance. That's evil. It's evil because you're arrogant. Remember, he's talked earlier in this chapter about humility and pride. And pride is the whole idea of I'm going to leave God out of this. That's what Satan did. I will ascend to the throne of the Most High and I will take over and I will run, run the universe. And the scripture calls that pride. It's I'm going to leave God out. And James says that is just plain sinful. You're, matter of fact, Boasting about that is evil. That's what it call, he calls it. It's, it's almost like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be my God. I'm going to decide what happens. And God himself said, you shall have no other gods before me. So to put any God, including yourself, above the true and living God is evil when you boast about it. Then he says in verse 17, to him that knows to do good. 
and does it not? To him it is sin. So this is not just what you do, boasting. It's what you don't do. Now the question is, what is the good thing in verse 17? Well, I would say that the good thing in this passage is leaving God in. It's very clear from verse 15. So to know to leave God in, this is talking to believers, and leave him out, well, that's sinful. So in this case, it's not what you did, as in verse 16, it's what you didn't do, in verse 17. It's like the fellow who was told he was being fired. He said, for what? I didn't do anything. And his boss said, that's why you're being fired. (laughs) Well, that's what verse 17 is saying. We're fired. God, and that's sinful. I mentioned a moment ago a very famous poem. Somebody's rewritten it. Entitled, My Captain. And it says this. I have no fear, though straight the the gate. He cleared from punishment the scroll. Christ is my master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. So what I have to say today is really incredibly simple. To make plans and leave God out of those plans is stupid and sinful. Is that clear? Just plain dumb. Now, I want to make I want to clarify. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't make plans. As a matter of fact, I think if you just read verses 13 and 14 without taking the whole passage into consideration, you might conclude at that point that James is opposed to you making plans. Nothing could be further from the truth. God made a plan. Before the foundation of the world, he made the plan that included Christ dying for our sins. Now that's a plan. So God is not opposed to plans. Matter of fact, I think that you might even make an argument that God would be opposed to not having a plan. But that's not the point in this passage. This passage isn't just about making plans. It's about making plans that don't include the Lord. And it's stated very simply and very clearly in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. And the this or that is a very specific plan. We will do this or we will do that. That's the plan. But what you ought to say is, we're going to do that, Lord willing. Lord willing that I'm alive at the time And Lord willing, because I did it according to his word. You ever say that? You ever say, Lord willing? I find find myself saying it all the time. Uh, I'll see you Thursday. Lord willing. Well, that's what you ought to say. Just include the Lord in every area of your life. You ought to include the Lord if you're a student in the courses you take at school. Yes. Maybe you should consult some of the Lord for some of the courses you should take. Now, of course, if you've got a major, there are certain things you have to take. But perhaps there are things you could take that would enhance your spiritual life. You should certainly do that in your career, which would mean that you would be honorable and honest in the pursuit of your career. You should do it in your wedding, which means you would only marry a Christian, according to the scripture. You should do it in your work, which is done unto the Lord. Do it in your family life, and even do it in your finances. 
I've preached on this passage of scripture before, and I remember one of the applications I made was this. I'm going to make it again. Do you have a will? Is the Lord in it? Uh, I know people uh, who've made wills and included the Lord in distributing all of their assets. A certain amount went to the Lord's work. I pastored a church once that was failing when I became pastor. And they would have failed a long time ago had it not been that a lot of people in that church had given money to the church in their will. And I remember being in a board meeting once and we were talking about that. And uh, one of the board members said, Pastor, we survive on the giving of the members. Some are alive and some are in heaven. And the will got settled and we got the payment and we were able to meet the budget. And that really struck me. You ought to put the Lord in your will. As a matter of fact, let me go one step further. If you own a house in the state of California, you ought not have a will. You ought to have a living trust. Because if you have assets over $100,000, then in order to those to be distributed outside of your mate, which I assume you got everything in joint custody, there has to be something called probate, a probate court. And the only way to get around that probate court is to have a living trust. A living trust, uh, Patricia and I used to teach a financial seminar, and we invited an attorney who specialized in trust to give this part of the seminar, and that's how I learned this. He compared it to a cookie jar. And he compared all your assets to cookies. And he would put cookies in all of his pockets. And then he'd say, you know, this cookie is your house. And this cookie is your bank account. And this cookie is your retirement plan. And this cookie is your assets, your investments. And he'd say, if you die with all those cookies on you, even if you have a will, you've got to go to probate court. Your survivors do. And that's expensive. And at that time, he was saying, in the state of California, it took nine months to get it settled. So that you shouldn't have a will. Where there's a will, there's probate court. So what you need is a living trust. And then he put a cookie jar up on the table. And he said, a cookie jar is this. You take all your cookies and you put them in the cookie jar. And legally, you don't own them anymore. So when you die, there's no cookies on you and there's no probate court. That sounds awfully scary to me. So who controls the cookie jar? You do. You and your mate are joint. I mean, just like you own everything else joint, you own the cookie jar joint. So legally, you don't own it. The cookie jar owns it. But you two are in control. This is beautiful. And when one of you dies, the other one automatically takes over. And then you have a successor trustee. So when the second one dies, that successor trustee, whoever you name, then distributes the assets the way you say. And uh, that's really good because if there's a will, the minute that will is read, everything has to be distributed right that minute. But if you've got a living trust, you can uh, do all kinds of creative things. Uh, so if you've got two kids and one of them hadn't gotten his head together yet, you say, yeah, you get my portion of your inheritance, your portion of the inheritance, when you're 30 and married. You can't do that in a will, but you can do it in a living trust. Now, by the way, the successor trustee is bound by law to do exactly what that trust says. Now, I bring all this up for two reasons. One is to remind you, you at least need a will, and you really, if you have any assets at all, need a living trust. The last time I did this, somebody came to me six months later and said, as a result of that sermon, I got a living trust. So we need to give an invitation this morning. For all those who decide to get out a living trust. <laughs> I'm kidding. But the second reason I bring this up is you need to put the Lord in the will. 
put the Lord in the trust. That is, distribute your assets any way you wish and give some to the Lord. Not a bad idea. You're not going to need them anymore, right? So give some of them to the Lord. That's including the Lord in your future plans. I can't think of a better illustration or application for this passage than that. And by the way, if you say to me, I own a house, and it isn't worth, I don't have 100000 in equity, doesn't matter. And an attorney explained to me once, if you, the illustration he gave me was this, if you own a $400,000 house, and you owe $399,000 on it, so that your equity is $1,000. As far as the state of California is concerned, you have a $400,000 asset, and it's got to go to probate court. So if you have an asset valued over that, regardless of what you owe on it, you need a living trust. Now that's one application. I just mentioned some others. But the point is this. We should get up every day and say, Lord, I do this before I get out of bed. Did it this morning. Lord, here, here's what I know is going to happen today. There's a whole bunch of things I don't know, but this is what I know. So I want, before I get out of this bed, which is risky stuff these days, before I get out of bed, I, I want to just, I want to talk to you about all the things I know is going to happen. You do that? And then, Lord, all those things I don't know is going to happen. That's what you're going to have to take care of for sure. Now, that's planning that includes the Lord. As you walk through the day, constantly talk to the Lord about what's happening. I am constantly talking to people, and they're asking me questions, and I'm saying, Lord, are you listening? Help! What in the world am I going to say to this person when he shuts up? What am I going to say? Do it all the time. And a lot of time, God answers. And when he doesn't, I'm really hung. So we just need to include the Lord. And that's James's point. That you need to include the Lord in everything you do. In all of your plans. There's a story about a Persian prince who decided that in order to accomplish all that he wanted to do in life, he was going to divide it into four periods. He determined that the first period of his life would be given to travel. The second part of his life would be given to the affairs of state. The third period part of his life, he would give to his friends just to enjoy them and their friendship. And the fourth part of his life, he would give to God. As the story goes, the prince died unexpectedly at the end of the first period in his life. His life was cut short his well-laid plans were never fulfilled. The most significant thing about that story is that the most important part of his life, the purpose for which he was created, was neglected entirely because he didn't plan to include God in every stage of his life. James would say, that's not smart. That's just plain stupid. Let's pray.